we are going to be reading from Mark chapter 1, verse 20, to, or sorry, verse 12 to 20. So that is Mark chapter 1, verse 12 to 20. Today's message is titled, Building God's Kingdom. Building God's Kingdom. The Temptation of Jesus. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little further, further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. May God bless the reading of his word. So last week we talked about how John the Baptist was the forerunner for Jesus. John went before Jesus to prepare the way. And he was in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River. And Jesus came to be baptized by John. And when John saw Jesus coming toward him, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who, comes to, who takes away the sin of the world. John baptized Jesus in Mark 1, verse 10, or 10 to 11. We see a beautiful picture of the Trinity. All three persons of the Godhead are involved. Jesus was in the water. The Spirit descended on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. God the Father confirms Jesus' identity that he is the Son of God. And what I find interesting is that the Gospel records that there were three times that God the Father was heard to speak audibly. The first time is here at Jesus' baptism. The next is at the Mount of Transfiguration in Mark chapter 9, and in John 12 and verse 28 in response to Jesus' prayer. After Jesus was baptized, we see in verse 12, that the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. Just like Adam, Jesus would be put in a place of testing. Adam and Eve were tempted by the devil, or by the serpent in the garden. And while the second Adam would be tempted in the wilderness, where he is isolated and all alone. Jesus did not have a companion like Adam did. Adam and Eve also had food at their disposal, where Jesus was in a fast. In Matthew 4, verse 2, we see that he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. He was hungry with nothing to eat. And the devil came and tempted him. And there are three things that I want to talk about here this morning that I believe will help us in building God's kingdom. The first is that we need to resist the devil. We need to resist the devil. We need to resist giving into temptation. Look at what it says in verse 13. And he, that would be Jesus, was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. Being tempted implies that the temptations happen over the 40 day period. So it was not limited to the three temptations that we read about in Matthew's account. In Luke 4 verse 2 it says, For forty days being tempted by the devil. 
And Mark gives us a brief account of Jesus' temptation, whereas Matthew and Luke go into more detail about the temptations that Jesus faced. We see over in Matthew's account that Jesus was tempted three times by the devil. And all three times he quoted from the book of Deuteronomy. And we see that he quoted scripture. He quoted the word. And we also see that he obeyed the word. And I believe if we want to be victorious in temptation, if we want to resist the devil, then I believe it will be crucial for us to not only know the word, but to obey the word. And temptation, as I said last week, is not a sin. It is giving into the temptation that makes it a sin. We know Christ was tempted, and yet he never sinned. And this is why Christ can relate to us when we are tempted. Because he was tempted in every area that you and I are tempted, yet without sin. In Hebrews 4, verse 15, we read these words. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And we will all be tempted in life. What temptations are you facing in life? What temptations have we faced since last Sunday to this Sunday? Because in James 1 verse 13, it says, let no one say when he is tempted. It doesn't say if he is tempted, it says when. We will all be tempted in life. What temptations are we facing in life? How is our battle going with sin? Are we killing sin or is sin killing us? And not only do we need to resist the devil, we need to resist giving into our fallen nature. We have a sinful nature that is bent towards evil. And every day we will have to die to self. We will need to deny ourselves, take up our crosses, and follow Jesus. And we are to walk by the Spirit, so we will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And when we are tempted, we will not know how bad the temptation is until we go against it. As a lot of you know, I love to run. And if I am running and if the wind is at my side or if it's at my back, I don't really know the full force of the wind. But a lot of times I'll do like an open back route. So I'll run out somewhere and then I'll turn around and run back. And I will run into the wind. And it's when I turn around and go against the wind that I feel the full force of it. And it's the same thing with temptation. It's when we go against the temptations in our lives that we will feel the full force against it. Jesus felt the full force of temptation, and yet he never gave into it. And I believe if we want to build God's kingdom, it will be crucial for us to resist the devil, to resist giving into temptation. We need to resist the devil. In James 4, verse 7, we read, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will what? Flee from you. And part of the reason why Christ came was to destroy the works of the devil. In 1 John 3, verse 8, we read, The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by the devil, and the angels were ministering to him. After Jesus' temptations, Mark records the beginning of his Galilean ministry. We see in verse 14 that John was arrested. John the Baptist was put in prison for rebuking Herod by telling him that it was unlawful to marry his brother's wife Herodias. And after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. He was proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. In Mark's time, the good news was God's reign through the Messiah. The fact that God is ready to rule and reign in people's hearts and lives is good news. And we see back in verse 1 that this is the beginning of the good news. For Mark's later audience, 
We know the good news is that God has provided salvation through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 15 says, The time is fulfilled. The one John said was coming is now here. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus taught both present and future dimensions of the kingdom. Presently, God's rule and reign in people's hearts and lives is now being established. When people repent and trust Christ Jesus as their Lord, they become Christians. For born-again believers, God is ruling and reigning in their lives. And this is happening right now, presently. And yet there's also a future aspect to the kingdom, where there will be a literal kingdom. The kingdom is already, but not yet. And if there is a kingdom, well that means there must be a king. And Jesus Christ is that king. The kingdom is near because the king is here. And the arrival of the kingdom required an immediate response. How do we enter the kingdom? How should we respond? Jesus said in verse 15, repent and believe in the gospel. We see that Jesus had the right message. If we want to build God's kingdom, not only will we need to resist the devil and resist giving into temptation, but we need to have the right message. We will need to know the gospel. If we have the wrong message, we are not going to build God's kingdom. It is that simple. And my fear is that there are people who will water down the message to try to make it more appealing where they neglect talking about sin or repentance. And if we water the message down to try to make it more appealing, then we are not going to build God's kingdom. The only thing we are going to build are false converts. We need to have the right message. What Christ preached back then is what we preach today. We tell people to repent and to believe in the gospel. And the gospel is good news. It tells us how we can have peace with God. When people receive the gospel, it will be the greatest moment in their entire lives. And many here this morning can testify to that. People can give personal testimonies about the changes that Christ has made in their lives. For those who reject the gospel, for those who reject Christ, Ultimately, they will fall under the judgment of God. In Hebrews 10, verse 29, we read these words. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? Earlier in Hebrews 2 or verse 3, we read, How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? And in Mark 1 or verse 15, we see that Jesus had the right message, repent and believe in the gospel. And both these verbs in the Greek are present imperatives. In other words, what Jesus is saying is for the rest of your lives, I want you to repent and believe in the gospel. This is not a momentary thing. It is to live in the condition of repentance and trust. And repentance is a change of mind, and a change of mind always leads to a change of living. Repentance is to turn from. Belief is what we turn to. So we turn away from ourselves, we turn away from our sins, and we turn to Christ. We place our faith and trust in Him. If someone refuses to repent, he or she will never see the kingdom of God. In Mark 6, Jesus sent out the apostles. And you want to know what they preached? They went out and proclaimed that people should repent. People must flee from their sin and trust in Christ alone for their salvation. If John the Baptist, Peter, and Jesus all started out their ministry talking about repentance, then I believe it is vital for us to talk about repentance and faith with people today. We need to have the right message. 
In other words, we need to know the gospel. And in Mark 1, verse 16 to 20, we see what repentance and faith looks like in action. Verse 16 says, Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. I went to uh, Israel a few years ago, and I had the privilege of being on the Sea of Galilee. And it sits in like a bowl. It is surrounded by hills and mountains, and it sits about 696 feet below sea level, which makes it the lowest freshwater lake on the planet. And in Jesus' day, there was prosperous fish, it was there's a prosperous fishing industry around the Sea of Galilee. And as many of you know, many of Jesus' disciples were fishermen. And as Jesus walked alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. What I find interesting is that in the ancient world, students would seek out their rabbis. Well, Jesus is unlike any other rabbi. Jesus is the one who seeks out after them. Do you remember what Jesus said to his disciples in John 15 and verse 16? You did not choose me, but I chose you. God is the one who seeks out after us. I never found Jesus. Jesus found me. You say, well, James, we, we love God. We love God because he first loved us. And the fact that God allows people to follow him is, by, is solely by his grace. And when Jesus says, follow me, this was a radical call to discipleship. And this kind of call demanded an immediate response. Look at what it says in verse 18. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. They would become the Lord's permanent disciples. Instead of fishing for fish, they would fish for people. The gospel would be like a net that would pull people out of the dark waters and lift them out into the light. And God wants us to fish for people. He wants us to faithfully share the gospel with others. Are we casting out our nets? If our nets are not in the water, then we are not going to catch any fish. We need to cast out our nets and pray and ask the Lord to bring in some fish. We need to catch people with the good news of the gospel. And if we want to build God's kingdom, we will need to resist the devil. We will need to resist giving into temptation. But we see that we will also need to have the right message. We need to know the gospel, and it is so important for us to know the gospel and share the gospel with others. Even our friends who are Christians, we can share the gospel with. We can take turns sharing the gospel with one another. We can tell the gospel to ourselves on a daily basis, or we can be driving somewhere. Tell the gospel to yourself. That way, when we share the gospel with others, it will just flow through us. And the last thing I want to talk about is that we need to find the right people. We need to find the right people. If I want to go out and tell others about Christ, well, I will need to find the right people. I will need to find people who will step out in faith and go out and share the gospel with me. We need to find the right people. Look at what it says in verse 19 to 20. And going on a little further, he saw James, his son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending the nets. And immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. They left everything to follow him. They left their nets, they left their boats. James and John left their father to follow Jesus. And in Luke 14 and verse 26, this is what Jesus said to the crowds. If anyone comes to me, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Our love for God 
should be so much greater than our love for our mother or father that it should look like hate in comparison. We need to put Christ first in our lives. And if we have any idols in our lives that are getting between us and Christ, we need to cast them aside. We need to get rid of them. James and John left Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants. In a society where honoring one's parents was one of the greatest values. And it says they had hired servants, which shows that they were well off. And they left it all to follow Jesus. Which raises a question, who is this man? I mean, they left their nets, they left their boats, they left their families to follow him. Who is he? Mark reminds us in verse 1, this is the Messiah. This is the Son of God. And later, Mark's account, we see what it looks like to follow Jesus. In Mark 8, verse 34, Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. In Jesus' day, when people would look at a cross, they would see someone hanging from it. They knew what that meant. And in this and in the passage that Peter read out for us earlier, it was the parallel passage to this one. And it said daily, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. It says in Luke 9 verse 23. Are we taking up our crosses daily and following Christ? How do we build God's kingdom? We need to resist the devil, resist giving in to temptation, we have all sinned against a holy and righteous God. When Adam fell, we fell. When sin came, death came. The second Adam came from heaven. He left the glories of heaven, took on the form of a servant, and he lived a perfectly obedient life, upholding the law, fulfilling all of its demands, and he went to the cross to be the substitute for our sins. Christ was the wrath remover who died in our place and rose on the third day. And if we want to build the kingdom of God, we need to have the right message. And if any of you were here this morning and you do not know Christ, repent and believe in the gospel. Maybe you were here this morning and you were in bondage to sin. Christ has the power. Christ has the authority to set you free. And if the Son of God sets you free, you will be free indeed. And you know what the wonderful thing is? God is still calling people today. God is still calling people to follow Him today. Ask the Lord to give you the faith to believe. Faith is a gift. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. And I believe repentance is a gift as well. Ask the Lord to grant you repentance that leads to life. Ask the Lord to change your heart. For those of us who, is, who have placed our faith in Christ, our sins were transferred to Christ's account, and His righteousness was transferred to our account. For believers, God looks at us as if we lived the life that Christ lived. When Jesus was on the cross, God looked at Jesus as if He lived the life that we lived. And on the day of judgment, God will see Jesus and his righteousness for those who are in Christ Jesus. In conclusion, how do we build God's kingdom? We resist the devil. We need to have the right message. And we need to find the right people. People who will step out in faith to have an impact for God's kingdom. Let us pray. Father God, we uh, thank you so much for your word, and we know that we will all be tempted in life, Lord. And we just pray, Father, that you give us the strength to overcome the temptations that we face in life. We know it is for believers, Lord, that you have placed your Holy Spirit within us, that you have given us the power to overcome the temptations that we face in life. We know, Lord, that there have been times where we have fallen far short, and we just ask for your forgiveness, Lord. Help us live for you. Help us be obedient to you. And we thank you that in the midst of temptation, that you give us a choice 
to say yes to you and to say no to sin. Help us have an impact in and outside of our community. And help us build up your kingdom 